Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at the epistles of Peter in our continuing survey of the New Testament. The first epistle of Peter, we could entitle this epistle Submissive Suffering, because it's going to be given in the context of such suffering. He starts off, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout, and then he mentions a number of places, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. These are all locations in what we call the country of Turkey today. Back then they referred to this as Anatolia, the, the land of the east of Greece. Um, uh, and he calls them, you know, these. he's writing to those who are uh, from these places who are chosen. Um, and what we have is in the first section of this whole epistle is going to be divided into three major sections. It's going to be a call to holy living. But let's see how that ta begins to sh take shape early in this epistle. He starts off, uh, once he's gotten through his, his very brief introduction, uh, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and then he, now that he mentions Jesus Christ, he needs to speak about him, who has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Notice he brings in this idea of the new birth. Uh, we've, be, we've been caused to be born again because of what Jesus Christ has accomplished. And uh, that was to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. But notice we're not finished with the sentence yet. He goes on to say, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. So already we're speaking about the trials through which these Christians are going. And he explains that these come so that your faith may be proved genuine, and it may result in praise, glory, and honor. And you rejoice in all that, obtaining as the, the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Now notice that that idea of salvation of your souls is going to take and build on that in the next section. He says, as to this salvation, the prophets searched uh, about it, the angels longed to look into it, and therefore, because it's such a, a big deal, gird your minds for action, keep sober, fix your hope on grace, and, and here's the big idea, be holy. And so he goes on to say, and if you address his father, the one who impartially judges according to each man's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay upon earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things, but you were redeemed with the blood of Christ. Notice how we come full circle. We started talking about salvation, and now how you ought to live on the basis of that because of how you were saved. Now, he says, since you have a, in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. So big ideas, you know, live in a correct way and love one another from the heart. Why? Because you've been born again. Again, he's bringing this back to the new birth and you've been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but that which is imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. Now we're going to take that word abiding and we're going to build upon it. You see, fresh is like, uh, flesh is like grass, but the word abides. And so, because the word abides, and you have been born again through that which is abiding, you have an abiding love. Therefore, putting aside all malice, and all guile, and hypocrisy, and envy, and all slander, long for the pure milk of the word. Why? that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. Notice how we started off with salvation, and you need to grow in that salvation. Therefore, putting aside all malice, 
and all guile and hypocrisy and envy and all slander long for the pure milk of the word uh, that by it you may grow in respect to salvation why because you know we started with salvation and you need to grow in that salvation and coming to him as a living stone we're in chapter 2 now uh, he, he was rejected by men but chose choice and precious in the sight of God you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood um, and if you're bu being built up as a holy priesthood you're to be offering up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ now what can you say about a temple he's using the analogy of a temple remember a temple uh, has it's a holy place and it has a holy priesthood so therefore you're supposed to be holy too Um, and that rock, that, you know, that foundation, uh, he says, Behold, I lay a in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, that's for you who believe. For those who disbelieve, uh, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone. It became a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. But you hold on to Jesus, and you will see him as that choice stone, that precious cornerstone. And you won't be disappointed. Um, for those who disbelieve to this doom they were also appointed he says but you are and we're culminating this section in in this right here you are a chosen race a royal priesthood a holy nation a people for god's own possession now as peter says that those are familiar words he's echoing exodus chapter 19 which was a description given to israel but he is saying this of these believers uh, and you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, of people for God's own possession, in order that you may pro proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And so live like it. Now, that was the call to holy living. Be holy because God is holy and you, you were called to that new holy lifestyle. Next, we have a call to submissive living. And that begins in chapter 2, verse 13. In other words, uh, take that, that holiness and let's put that into practice in how you live. And so he starts off, chapter 2, verse 13, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake, to every human institution. And he describes a number of these. Uh, servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect. Chapter 2, verse 18. Uh, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands. Chapter 3, verse 1. Husbands, there's a sense of, you know, we, we, talk, we always talk about wives being submissive to their husbands, but, but husbands likewise. In, in other words, I've got something similar to you to say. Live with your wives in an understanding way. That's, that's a form of submission too. And it doesn't start stop there. Let all be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. In other words, everybody ought to be submissive because Christianity is a religion of submissiveness. We submit ourselves to God and we submit ourselves one to another. Now, we had the call for holy living. We had the call to submissive living. That took us through uh, chapter 3, verse 13. Next, we have a call, and there's the idea of suffering has been seen throughout, but here specifically, he's going to give a call to suffering. Uh, he says, but even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed, and do not fear their intimidation, and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense. That word defense, apologia. We, we get our word apologetics from that. Always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. We ought to have answers. If somebody asks, we ought to have answers why we believe the things we believe. And yet we don't want to do that with arrogance. We do it with gentleness and reverence and we do it with a lifestyle that backs it up. And keep a good conscience, 
so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. We ought to live in such a way that backs up what we believe. He says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though it were some strange thing that were happening to you. You know, don't be surprised when you get persecuted. Don't be surprised when you're burned at the stake. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, now that doesn't mean we're paying for sin, but it means he suffered and we suffer. It means that the world wanted to crucify him and they'll want to crucify us. And to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the re revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you're blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you and they wanted to get at him and they'll want to get at you too. He says, for it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? In other words, if God's bringing judgment and it starts with us getting judged and we're the ones that are God's chosen and we're the ones that who, who God loves, then how much worse will it be for those who do not obey the gospel? And if it's with difficulty that the righteous is saved, it's not really saying it's hard to be saved, it's saying that getting saved brings difficulty. Then what's going to become of the godless man and the sinner? What kind of difficulty does he have to look forward to seeing? Therefore, let those also who suffer according to the will of God entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. And so we have uh, the entire book. Now let's turn to 2 Peter. 2 Peter is going to be very easy. I'm going to just give a real brief presentation. Um, chapter 1 deals with the past. Chapter 2 deals with the present. Chapter 3 deals with the future. Let's look at those categories. In chapter 1, we start off with a call. Gee, this looks familiar from 1 Peter. With a call to holy living. Um, and, and about how we're called to live in a, in a proper way. Um, in a way that recognizes uh, God's precious and magnificent promises. I'm borrowing from, from chapter 1, verse 4. Um, and he says, For this reason, apply in all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. Do those things because they will show the fruit of who you have become in Christ. And then he goes from there to speak about how the Lord came. The first coming of the Lord. He says in chapter 1 verse 16, For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw something on the majestic mountain. Remember the transfiguration? He alludes to that. And we had that, that word from the Lord, the majestic glory, who said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And because we have that prophetic word made more sure, we ought to hold to that, and you ought to pay attention to that as, a, as you'd pay attention to a lamp shining in a dark place. So you will remember that, that no prophecy, and I'm in verse 20 down, no prophecy of the scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation because these things came not from an act of human will, but as men were moved by the Holy Spirit and spoke from God. And so you hold that holy loving because Jesus came, and not only did he come, but he also said that false teachers, they rose and and there's also going to be false teachers. In fact, you get the, the sense there are false teachers. And he has quite a bit to say in chapter 2 about false teachers. About how uh, these are the ones even denying the master who bought them. 
uh, and what they're going to do and what they're doing and, and how if God didn't spare the angels when they sinned and if he didn't spare the ancient world uh, in the days of Noah when it sinned and if he condemned Sodom and Gomorrah when they sinned and if he rescued righteous Lot uh, then the Lord knows how both to judge as well as to rescue the godly from temptation. And so you take note against that. And so it's a call don't be swayed by those false teachers. Don't be part of that. Indeed, he says, it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed to them. Um, and so we go from the past to the present and then to the future. In the future, remember in chapter 1 we talked about the first coming of the Lord. Here in chapter 3, he speaks about the second coming of the Lord. He says, know this first of all, that in the last days uh, mockers are going to come with their mocking uh, saying, where's the promise of his coming? Well, remember with uh, the days of Noah, they had been saying those sorts of things and, and all of a sudden judgment finally came. And you be aware too, chapter 3 verse 9 for the Lord is not slow about his promises, some count slowness, but is patient toward you not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. There's a command for everyone to come to repentance. Because the day of the Lord will come like a thief. In which the heavens will pass away with a roar. And the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. And the earth and its works will be burned up. And so the Lord's coming. And because the Lord is coming. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way. What sort of people ought you to be. Here it is. In holy conduct and godliness looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God and so you ought to do that you ought to be living a holy life as you look for the coming of the Lord and he says in verse 14 therefore beloved since you look for these things be diligent to be found by him in peace spotless and blameless and regard the patience of our Lord remember how we talked about uh, God is patient toward you back in verse 9 he says regard the patience of our Lord as salvation because God has been patient you're saved and he alludes to he, he sort of gives a little footnote to the Apostle Paul uh, in, in verses 15 and 16 and he says therefore you therefore, verse 17, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness, but instead grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen.